Okay, well, I, I am so glad to be here uh, with Nessa Rappaport, who is one of my uh, closest and best friends who I've known for some, I don't know, 35 years. Um, and Nessa has written, uh, originally wrote a, a novel called Preparing for Sabbath. She's written um, a book of poetry, uh, a woman's book of grieving and uh, The House on the River, which is a travel memoir. And now she has uh, her new novel called Evening, which I have uh, strategically placed behind me. And uh, it's gotten rave reviews from uh, every place, including Vogue and Refinery29 and Haaretz and the Globe and Mail and uh, even Shondaland, which is no Shonda. And um, I couldn't resist making that joke. And uh, so- We have to uh, forgive you, Tom, because Yom Kippur was this week. Yeah, thank you. You're and, welcome. And uh, so uh, I thought we'd start, Nessa, by like just recalling how we originally met, which was kind of- That's fun. a great idea. Yeah. You do, you do it. Your memory is better than mine. Well, so uh, I was writing a piece for Andy Warhol's interview magazine on young editors. And, uh, um, and we wanted to have, in, there were some people that uh, Andy wanted in the article. And <laughs> there were all, some people we wanted to have um, more uh, women editors uh, in the mix. And so I was busily reading through uh, Publishers Weekly uh, for many, many weeks. And I came across a profile of Nessa who had published her first uh, novel and was a uh, big deal in publishing because she had uh, edited a book that established the business biography category, which was Iacocca, written by our mutual friend, Bill Novak. And so I went to uh, Nessa's office um, I, I was surprised, first of all, that you knew what Interview Magazine was, but I, <laughs> but I went to, to your office um, in, in an office building on Fifth Avenue in the 50s, and uh, I guess I was surprised that your office was smaller than I expected for such a powerful editor. I'm, I, w I probably was smaller than you expected, too. <laughs> I still am. <laughs> But, but but I think, uh, you know, it's funny, I was trying to think, you know, this was before there was uh, cell phones and texts and, and, and uh, you know, all that communication. And somehow, in that short meeting, which couldn't have been longer than a half an hour, we somehow clicked enough that I think our lives began to intersect. And we well, I can tell you on the other side, um, Interview Magazine was a very hip place to appear, but editors are notoriously behind the scenes introverted people for the most part. So when I got there, they actually styled, well, I was there alone because everybody had their own slot, but they styled me as if I were a supermodel. I had clothes that they gave me, they put on makeup for hours, they did my hair, and then they wanted me to do all these elaborate poses, I still remember like this, and like this crazy, you know, magazine poses, and I was both bemused and kind of horrified, being <laughs> like, what's going to happen with these images, uh, and then when it came out, you may recall, all of us were in a kind of haze as if they had put you know one of those gauze oh, Vaseline yeah. lenses and I really think it's because we were as a category so uptight that we just couldn't relax in front of the camera so they just decided to kind of smear us all out <laughs> but I still have a paper copy of it from long long ago. Me too. Me too. So uh, let's turn to your novel Evening. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit first about what it's about and then maybe read us uh, the opening? Sure. Uh, evening opens in a Shiva house and it's about two sisters in their 30s, one of whom is grieving for the other before uh, the end of the eldest one's life. Uh, the sisters had a stupendous fight and did not reconcile. And after the first 
day after the funeral, the very next day, Eve, the narrator, discovers a secret about her sister named Tam that she didn't know and that upends her whole idea of her sister and herself and her family. And the working of that out is the novel with, I hope, plenty of twists and turns. It's not a mystery, it's a work of fiction, but it has propulsion, I hope. And in order to, in order to attain that accelerated speed, it took me 26 years to write it. Well, we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, later, but um, read it. Why don't you read the opening? Sure. One loves, the other is loved. So Nana taught us. I look at the beautiful bones of her face and speculate about this pronouncement. My grandmother has always been beloved, and so my grandfather, long dead, assumes a peculiar poignancy. Once in some rapturous, unimaginable youth, before she married, Nana was the ardent lover. But no one is alive to tell us about the object of her affection, and she will not disclose his name. We are sitting in the living room of my mother's house, waiting for the funeral to begin. Outside, the sky is the eerie pewter I remember from my childhood, lightless even at midday. In this room six years ago, before our mother recovered the furniture yet again, Tam and I were laughing at the weather. Then too, it was noon when I realized after her baby's naming ceremony was over and the last guests had straggled out, that the day would not improve, that to quote Tam, this is it. I had fled to New York, whose winters are tamed by the city's determination to outwit the season. In Toronto, betraying our, betraying our pact to leave the minute we could, but chose a profession that forced her to rise most mornings at four in order to be on the air. For her, the half year of darkness is permanent, I think to myself, and then think, permanent darkness. Paralyzed, I stare at Nana, imploring her to rescue me, but she is stoic, not admitting whatever feelings she no doubt has. The fact is, my sister, her eldest grandchild, is dead. The silence in this room is not the anticipatory hush preceding a family celebration, but the void of what cannot be accommodated. Tam, in speaking my sister's name, I have invaded Nana's solitude. I look at her carefully and observe, even in the somber room, that the skin beneath her eyes is gleaming. No one has seen my grandmother cry. Beautiful. So it, it begins with it begins with that declaration: "One loves, the other is loved." And uh, uh, as we read through the novel, that to some extent um, foreshadows some of the relationships, but also it's an act of misdirection too. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you had that phrase from the start, or whether it came to you later. That's a good question, and I knew you'd ask good questions. Let me think. I didn't have it as the opening. The whole chapter came to me in one instant, um, a writing experience that I had not had before and sadly have not had since, including the rest of the book. I thought it would be a breeze. I thought the whole thing would happen in a year. No. Um, but this novel is not autobiographical. What happened instead is all these little tidbits and tendrils that had lodged in my unconscious surfaced in ways that I really don't feel I was in control of. And this little aphorism was one of them, mm. which had been said to me in my family, not about me, but in general. And um, that's how it happened. I think in in my family we would say uh, one is the entertainment, the other is the audience. Uh, uh. Might, might, might be uh, might be my description. Um, now this novel also talks about sisters, uh, both Eve and Tam, but also Nell and Nana. Right. And I know you are one of a gaggle of sisters. Right. Uh, 
Talk a little uh, bit. A, a, rap, a rapture of Rappaports is how I call it. <laughs> there are four sisters within six years, and I'm the eldest. So talk a little bit about the power and the sort of um, uh, of sisters and, and why that so appealed to you to explore in this novel. Well, I once edited a book by Francine Clagsburn, a friend and a wonderful writer, who made an obvious point I hadn't thought of, which is no one knows you as long as your siblings do. Your parents do, but they leave the stage, ideally, before you do. So for stretches of time, your siblings know you longest. And there's an intimacy about sisters. You know each other's bodies. You know each other's scent. There's a rivalry and competition that's not a, I'm not speaking about the classic um, pre-feminist idea of sisters, but it's inevitable that you measure yourself against your sisters. If you go to the same school, the sister who comes after you hears about you or vice versa sometimes. So there's this, it's a complex relationship and you have a culture that you create and a set of jokes that you tell there's a vocabulary. It's a thing. <laughs> so, um, and it's not something I was conscious of, obviously, when I was growing up, because that's all I knew. Although, interestingly, my mother is one of five and the only girl. My father was one of three, no girls. So I do have a, I feel sorry for them that they had four daughters coming of age in the early, you know, late 60s, early 70s, when the youth culture was at its peak and adulation for the young was there. And here were these two parents growing up in the depression with a lot of deference to their parents and authority. Uh, it was a real shock <laughs> and they weren't alone, you know. Uh, so um, I think it's always fascinated me. And um, I'm not, I don't think I'm, I could ever be the kind of writer who wrote about a world I'd never heard of. I'm fascinated by these writers who set their novels in a far corner of Russia and seem to have all this verisimilitude. But I didn't write the story I knew, but I wrote of what I knew. Right, right. And, and um, one of the other themes or, or discussions in the novel, which I thought was really interesting, was about beauty. Mm -hmm. The uses of beauty, the impact of beauty, uh, again, why was that a topic that so captivated you? Well, that is something I stole from listening at many, many kitchen tables, as one does in, in a, as a porous child, because in families where there is one beauty, an allure grows up around it, a mystique, what does it earn you, what doesn't it earn you, and that always intrigued me. So I heard stories of beauties of previous generations and the cost of beauty and again it what i didn't plot this out i didn't have a map but that that sense of sisters where one is striking and the other grows up with that sister i found really interesting i think the most important thing i can say about this question is and it, it's not something i realized until after i wrote the book Tam, the sister, has, quote, everything. She has a glamorous career. She has a very devoted husband, a beautiful old house, and two children. Eve is in the middle of her life, very indeterminate, hasn't, can't get it together to finish her dissertation, lives in rented rooms, rented small apartments, I should say, teaches in, you know, community colleges or, or you know, continuing education. And the world around them expects that Eve must be terribly jealous of Tam, but in fact, it's not so. And she doesn't think she is, but the story goes on to prove that she's not. And I was very interested in how in siblings, which are always complex, what it looks like on the outside really isn't the same as what it is on the inside. And that's something I really am interested in. Yeah, and it's... And it's, and it's, and it's plays out in the novel um, among many of the characters in many right. generations. Um, uh, but speaking of beauty, uh, I also want to talk about the beauty of your sentences. And- um, Now and, you're getting close to my heart, Tom. Well, uh, uh, again, uh, um, you spent a long time working 
on those sentences. And there is the uh, famous, uh, you know, giant document where you sort of made sure that you didn't overuse any description or, and, and so talk about that, um, that, uh, that desire for perfection in the right word in, in writing, which is obviously something I'm not afflicted with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're, we're, Tom is a person who just throws himself into the future, and Nessa is a person who needs Tom to constantly urge her to, to make even one move toward the future that takes her about three years, or as I like to say, from the thought to the deed for me can take a thousand years, for sure. So uh, I started out as a poet. I won some prizes when I was young as a poet. So obsession with language was always part of it. I grew up in a house where my mother corrected my friend's grammar, which I assure you did not endear her to them at all. And as I have written, uh, my son will say in the driest tone, mom's family's idea of fun is comparing their favorite grammatical errors. And then he goes into this riff, like, don't you hate it when someone overcorrects and says between you and I, you know, et cetera, you can picture it. Both my parents, and my father was a physician and my mother um, raised us, but had been a teacher and went back to being a teacher. Both of them had stacks of library books always. Uh, so there was an interest in the family. Reading was everybody's hobby. And, and I don't mean high-minded reading. I mean any kind of reading. Um, and in addition, I am a perfectionist, and as I have observed to you, I find it doesn't work very well when you apply it to your children or to your life, <laughs> but I was free. I didn't have a contract for this book, and it was very liberating for me to hold myself to the most exacting standards. I hurt no one but myself. Uh, I say that I spent a year checking only the words to make sure they weren't in too close proximity, or even things like, there's a lot of dialogue in the book, and I wanted to make sure that only one character would say, oh, comma, you know, whatever followed next. And the great thing about a computer is you can check, oh, comma, and guess what? I found more than one. But the truth is it didn't take me a year. It took me three years. <laughs> True confessions. But it's very satisfying to me to know that I gave this book absolutely everything. And there aren't very many realms in life that allow one to do that. There are deadlines and there's all kinds of flaws in the natural world. But in this case, with my 32 page single space double column document of every word in this book, I felt really good, I have to say. <laughs> but, not, but you know, the other thing that it made me think of, and I, and I don't know if this is something that, that you related to, uh, which is a, a, the a Jewish concept of Hidur Mitzvah. You know, okay. of the beautification, the, 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 uh, the joy in making something beautiful, you know, in, in that. And I, and I don't know if that's also part of what matters to you in this book, in doing this book so rigorously. I would say in this case, no. Finding the precise word mattered. I didn't want the language to draw attention to itself. Mm -hmm. um, because that would, that would be a kind of self-consciousness. And in fact, I will go on record and say that if I did see words too close together, but couldn't find another one that made sense, I wouldn't pick another word, which, which if I tried it, which you can do on a screen, just jumped out as just not working. Even, I, I wasn't going to adhere to a principle for its own sake. Right. Uh, and I didn't want to make a beautiful book. I wanted to make a book where every word was chosen. And I think that's what you're perceiving. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, you write of the English novelists between the world wars, who uh -huh. uh, your main character, Eve, is, uh, is doing her PhD on as, uh, you refer to them as, these were my women, as I think of them, striving to escape their Victorian upbringing. But, you know, I think that's also true of Eve and Tam who are each striving to break in from, from other definitions of themselves. I think that's true, but I never forget the impact 
of second wave feminism on the life of my generation. It is really different. And if you've read memoirs of those women, especially Virginia Woolf, the most famous of them, but there are many other women, wonderful novelists from that, from between you know, the end of the First World War and the beginning of the second, uh, you see that their lives were so constrained. And I quote um, Nana in the book, the grandmother, who's, if you do the math, or like around 90, talking about how pregnant women wouldn't leave the house to take a walk except after dark. And I did grow up with some of those stories. My grandmother was an astonishingly accomplished person, but she grew up in an era you know, before airplanes where women couldn't show their ankles. And as you know, women had no rights, not to their money and not to credit and not to anything. And I say to my kids all the time, I think I'd be in an insane asylum if it weren't for feminism. I always knew growing up in the 50s that something was awry and it wasn't, the 50s weren't the Victorian era. And of course there were exceptions always. So I think you're right that Tam and Eve are trying to break out of something, but I don't think it's quite the same as, they weren't up against the same obstacles as these women who were really meant to marry. One of the tragic elements of those women writers is a whole generation of men were killed in World War I. I mean, England really lost husbands. There were, I think it was close to a million missing men. So there were a lot of women who couldn't just take that path because the husbands weren't there. Mm. And, and um, now you've uh, described yourself as the Jewiest writer ever. <laughs> so I thought we would have some uh, 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 discussion of the Jewish aspects of this novel, um, starting with the fact that um, the novel takes place in Toronto. And um, these are not um, the Jews that we see on Seinfeld or Larry David, or even in the Canadian Montreal of Mordecai Rickler, they, they're quite um, uh, British in a way. A and even their, I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Laurie Colwyn, where they're Jewish, but it does, you know, it's sort of, it's on the sides a little bit. I don't know. Uh -huh. do, you, do you have a feeling about wanting to write about these kind of Jews? Or it's just what you know. I, I start when when I started out, they were more observant, <laughs> but they didn't turn out to be those people. And you and I were talking before. Whenever I would read interviews with writers where they said the characters just chose to do X or they got away from me, I thought it was a little pretentious. But I now am much more empathic <laughs> because I do feel I ended up showing a kind of Canadian Jewry of a certain moment. Canadian Jews are newer. Most of them were immigrants. It happens that my grandmother was born in Canada in 1897. That was considered very rare. They're a whole generation or two later than American Jews. So they are more small C conservative, just as Canadian culture generally is. And they were, by being closer to the immigrant generation, there was a lot more a sense of kind of let's call it tradition, at least for my generation. It wasn't quite the same as being observant, but there were norms, I guess I would say. And I became very interested in this family where the father by being, even Tam's father by being a first generation Canadian was much more close to and wanting to be traditional. And the mother who probably grew up similarly a, a little bit, I mean, not first generation, but had more tradition, rebelled as many women did who were not born into it in feminism in their teens, but who were, let's say, 10 or 20 years older than I, who walked out of their marriages and walked out of the bind of the 50s and found themselves, to use your excellent term. So I became intrigued by the difference between the parents in that way and the ways tradition did or didn't manifest itself in this family. Um, I was also interested, you know, I, I mean, I know that you're you are a writer writing out of a tradition. The tradition is everything you've read, but that tradition also includes a great and deep knowledge of Jewish text, uh, liturgical. Uh, we often joked about preparing for Sabbath and, and you know, the incense and myrrh. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so uh, are there, 
uh, Jewish textual, um, uh, even possibly liturgical references in the characters. Is Eve, an Eve is Tam, a Tamar, is Eve Jonah, is Tamar, Ezra, you know, what did, did these thoughts come in your mind when you were creating this? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Eve, Eve um, I, I, I work very carefully about the names of my characters. So I wanted that because Nana, the grandmother, is a very waspy but very Jewish person, which coincidentally my grandmother was, I wanted names that could stand in Canadian Anglo-Saxon culture, but also represented the not incidental Jewishness of this family. So in that sense, you're right. I, I chose names that were biblical, but not really parochial. Mm -hmm. I also, in, in the case of even this was deliberate. I, I, the book is called Evening, partly because the Jewish calendar starts in the evening and all the Shiva days are counted in the evening, partly because it has her name in it, Eve, but also because the book is about an evening between the two sisters, an evening out between the two sisters. So her name, I would say Eve's name is more loaded than Tam's name. I needed, for Tam, I needed a name that could have a good nickname, which is mm -hmm. how I got to Tamara, which is said only once in the novel. Right. Uh, now, also, this novel is about grieving. It's about 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 a shiva, and uh, uh, as you uh, ha as we've joked before, you know that <laughs> you are a um, you're someone who reads the obituaries, who lives around the corner from uh, where all Jews go when they die, <laughs> a river Riverside funeral. <laughs> uh, That's a coincidence, uh, Tom. <laughs> Maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> uh, um, so, so talk a little bit about why, and, and a woman's book of room, why this so compels you, this thrall, in a way, to grieving. I would say there are people born on the sunny side of the street. I think you're one of them. I emphatically am not one of them. My daughter likes to jokingly she once said to me when she was pretty young oh mom you and your morose childhood very accurate and i think that being a certain disposition dark dark disposition and being porous as a child and also i have to say although you and i are so different about this and your credentials are even better than mine um, growing up with so much knowledge of the Shoah as I did, unfiltered by child psychology. You know, now people would not show these documentaries of dead bodies piled up to children who are 10 and would, would censor a little bit developmentally what you learned when, but we didn't have that. It, it, at a time when the Holocaust was not nearly in the public discourse the way it has become, if you grew up when I did, where half my class were children of Hungarian Holocaust survivors, because I went to a Jewish school, and where we studied it, and my teachers were sometimes survivors too, and I can't even imagine the damage, because I was born in the early 50s. The Holocaust still, to me as a child, felt like centuries ago, but of course, it had just ended really, and it was in living, not just memory, but experience of so many people in Toronto. So I think the combination of temperament, being the kind of writer I am, and also, don't we repeat the things we're trying to resolve? So <laughs> knowing um, that sense of darkness and of fear, I think I was drawn to trying to figure it out. And uh, there's no question that whether you're sunny or not sunny, grief is coming your way. Um, right. But at least I have to say, at least this novel has the virtue of being funny. So yes, yes. Um, I, right. have my, I have my intensity and I forgot all about that thing you teased me about. And I, I do have to tell people what Tom means when he says, in, um, um, 
myrrh. The, what you used to say to me was no more myrrh. And what he meant yeah. by that was embedded in much of my work are Jewish texts that aren't alluded to directly in the work. And my favorite Jewish text is the Song of Songs, which is lyrical and erotic and stunning and has always been a text that meant so much to me. And of course, it has spices and orchards and lots of things, including myrrh. Um, it definitely occurs in everything I've written except this novel. And Tom has been known to say to me, yes, no more myrrh. I don't think I'm going to listen to you, but at least this time I did. Well, uh, uh, now in this novel, uh, the Shoah does make a uh, appearance. Yes, uh, it does. Uh, and uh, kind of, um, uh, it plays a very actually important uh, role uh, after it kind of appears, uh, the characters are quite transformed by certain realizations. I don't want to give away anything. Thank you, but, no spoilers. But, 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 you know, I do think, I mean, I think it's interesting that you you decided to do that and bring that in and have that be so uh, transformative. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or was it that you couldn't, it, it couldn't stay out of the book in a way? Those are the two poles. And yeah. I would say I fell between them. It, in no way was it a decision to treat the Shoah uh, because I would say I've devoted most of my adult life to the idea that we should not, as a people, identify with the Shoah as the primary metric of uh, Jewish identity. I felt and I feel strongly that being Jewish is meant to be festive and joyful and yes, to grieve the tragedies and the losses, but not to base our entire identity on Shoah, which by the way, remains the highest indicator of Jewish identity in North American, among North American Jews. I also have to quote, I've quoted my son, I've quoted my daughter, I'm gonna quote my youngest daughter, who when I was telling her all of this theory, said to me when she was a teenager, uh, when I was saying, I really think we shouldn't have what, what um, who called it the lachrymose theory of Jewish history, where it's just a list of our yeah. tragedies. My daughter said to me, mom, don't you think this is the least we can do for them? And I thought that was very beautiful. Of course, I must say, I think about the Shoah every single day. Every day it comes up in some way. Uh, I didn't expect it to come up in this novel because I felt there has been a tremendous amount of Jewish fiction about the Shoah, memoirs, but also a lot of fiction. It's one, because it's a primary indicator of identity, a lot of imaginative writers treat it. But again, Tom, that's what happened. That's who these people turned out to be. I have, I have a scene where the father um, of Eve and Tam is, is consoling himself in some ways, which I won't say so that I don't spoil it, with a, a scene connected to the Shoah. I didn't plan that. I was very surprised to see that come out of my, my metaphorical pen. And so you, you mentioned that you've spent uh, almost 30 years uh, writing this, this novel. Um, what was the moment at which you kind of turned the corner and saw that the end was in sight and that you could finish it? Was there something that happened? Or, or, or you know, because to some extent in your novel, the novel is in some ways about someone deciding um, not to be in stasis. Yes, well right? said, well said. Right? And so uh, this must have also happened to you with regard to this novel at a certain point. I'm getting dizzy. Um, it's very meta. Uh, it, it wasn't a dramatic situation. I wrote two books while I was writing this. And um, one was a woman's book of grieving. One was the memoir. I never let go of these two people. They continued to fascinate me. Uh, in fact, one person asked me, what was it about the 90s that interested you so much? And there wasn't anything about the 90s. It was about the 90s because that's when it started. The, the characters didn't change that much. What I really worked on, I could, first of all, I had to figure out what these two sisters were fighting about. 
I set up a real story in that first chapter and it made its demands on me. And until then, I hadn't been that kind of writer. I hadn't written a plot like that. I even, when I tried to figure out how to solve it, I went out to, for a coffee with Ted Salataroff, my mentor um, of a, a, a blessed memory, a, a plum true brilliant editor. And I was telling him that I was really struggling with how to make this plot sing. And he said, plot is character. When you know your characters, you'll know what to do. So I think just working at it and working at it, I have, I, it didn't change that much. I needed to, it's the structure. You know, it shuttles back scene to, to sing would be my metaphor. And in fact, my husband is an artist and he learns everything from seeing, not from language as I do. And he said he was shocked at how visual the book is because I don't think of myself as a visual, primarily a visual person, but I think that's because I kept refining the scenes to make sure that they they led you forward. Even if they were going back in the past, I wanted you to want to know what happened. Meanwhile, I was trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but but would you still be uh, playing with it or fixing with it, fixing it now if you could? Not at all. And I can truly say that's not been true for me for anything I've written. I, I, if I, I don't go back and reread my work, but if I do, pretty much I'm satisfied. I mean, the things that are 40 years old, I, I see now that I was young when I wrote it, but I'm so exacting that by the time I finish, I believe I'm done. And I'm a big believer that one should finish. There were skeptics who thought I would never let go of it, but I was not hanging on to it. I knew it wasn't where it needed to be. And I certainly had a sense when I finished it, I knew I had done what I set out to do. And I still feel that way. And it's, it's a kind of satisfaction that no one can take away from you. And no matter what anybody feels when they read it, I feel so serene about that. I feel very graced that I was able to write a book I wanted to write. Very lucky. Well, um, I'm going to open this up to questions if we have any, which people can put in through the chat. I also want to remind people that there's a link to buy the book. And I would just add that when you're buying um, a book, uh, you're not only uh, not just supporting the writer, but you're also supporting the publishing house, the bookstore, the ecosystem uh, in which these creative acts occur. And in order for us to be able to continue to have writers and publishers and to do events like this, um, one of the best indicators is to say, look how many books we sold. So I encourage you all um, uh, to buy this book and to buy other books, but certainly to buy this book. And to buy Tom's book, which is very unlike my book, but which was published pretty recently among many other books you've written. Yes. It, let's, uh, it's let's, been a, be, let's be reciprocal and not okay. be one loves the other is loved. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so let me, I'm going to check if there are some questions here. Um, let's see. I have the participants. I have the questions. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, David Kendall asks, can I ask about the process? Did the words come out a little at a time or in bursts? And how much of the story did you have at the, at the start? Didn't have the whole story at the start. My problem is sitting down to do it. When I sit down to write, I immediately go in, as, as when I read, I'm looking at David's little square here. Hi, David. Um, I, I'm immediately in this suspended, timeless place that gives me acute pleasure. However, mm. um, one way I navigate my perfectionism is to avoid writing, and I excel at avoiding writing. So some of the time for this book, was not really my exacting one word at a time, which I don't think I did. I, I refined it a lot. I read it many, many times. I, I, I probably read it hundreds of times, but 
once I sit down, it comes out. It's not always good. And I can tell anybody, I was an editor for many years. I know how to tell other people how to write a book, which is always have the same fixed slot and write badly. It's okay. The next day you'll come see it and you'll see exactly what's the matter. I followed none of that advice. So uh, I was really in an afflicted relationship with this book and with writing. And I used to describe it as small piece, peeling small pieces of skin off my body one at a time. Um, I don't feel that way about writing anymore, but I will also say that I continue to have a very push me, pull you relationship with it. And I know, and this I've also told other writers, the minute you finish a book, you should sit down and start working on your next book. I have precisely zero words of my next book. And the other thing I can say is write something every day because you get in the flow. Those of you who are writers on this screen know that your mind works kind of behind the scenes unconsciously. I do not write something every day. Whole weeks go by when I don't. So in addition to not writing, I also don't listen to my own advice. Well, well, I, I wouldn't want to compare uh, numbers of coffees versus keystrokes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this though, I knew before, I knew I would be a writer from my early teens. I always knew I would not write a lot of books. I, I was very struck in my brief tenure in graduate school from which I dropped out that when people wrote like 20 books or 12 books, there were only a couple of good books or there were only a couple of better books. I just wanted to write those better books. I didn't want to write all the other filler books. So I never thought I'd write more than four or five novels. I have one novel in a drawer that's very allegorical that I hope I'll publish. Which I've read, which I've read and I continue to be a champion of. Right, and which Tom has taught me now, I finally am in the digital age where if I never sell it, I can publish it myself. Um, but I, I didn't think I'd write that many. Uh, uh, Amy Handelsman asks, uh, not related to writing, but uh, rather uh, um, related to Judaism, has Jewish ritual grounded you during the pandemic? Interesting question. I jokingly said, I'm the Jewiest Jew that ever was. I'm not, but <laughs> Jewishness is at the absolute heart of everything I think and do. And I'm so shaped by being given the gift of Hebrew literacy from my parents, living in two calendars, the solar, the American calendar, and at the same time, the lunar, the Jewish calendar, thinking in two languages. I love the parts of Jewish life that I was given. I, I think the Sabbath day as a sanctuary from the digital age is genius. Uh, I think there's so many ways in which, I would say in answer to your question, Amy, we're meaning making people Jews and we're the people of eternity. So having a very long view has helped me a lot. I. I love history. I know pandemics have happened before. I know they end. I do, um, in the early part of this pandemic, we, we in New York, at least we in our family, weren't even leaving the house. So Shabbat became something very different because it was hard to distinguish it really. Of course, my computer wasn't on, my, I wasn't using my phone, but it was a long day. And I did try to break up the day like, for example, I really tried to make sure, and I still do, that there was always the white tablecloth and the better china and the silver. It was important to me not to kind of let those things deteriorate because I need ritual and I need to be anchored that way. Well, I think that is the end of our conversation, Nessa. So I want to thank you so much. I want to remind everyone uh, that evening is available. There's a link uh, that you should have access to. If not, there's this thing called Amazon. And um, it was so much fun talking to you, Ness. It was great. And I am going to get the last word because I'm the writer. And I want to say part of the reason this was a delight is because of our friendship. And I will say to respond to Amy, hmm. friendship has seen me through this pandemic. And I feel that one's friends are one's chosen family, to get back to the theme of my novel, and I am 
very blessed in my friends and Tom has a gift for friendship as anybody who knows him knows. So I think if you have enjoyed being part of our kitchen table here, it's because of our longstanding and very important friendship. So thank you for that, Tom. I thank you too. <laughs> Likewise, thank you everybody for coming and giving us the gift of your time. Thank you. I'm gonna uh, end our meeting. Bye. Bye.